Hi there. Welcome to the Sober Circle channel. Enjoy this speaker tape. Okay, here goes. For, for those of you who can't see the shirt, it has an American flag on it with a teddy bear standing in front of the American flag, and he has his paw raised, and it says, In Bears We Trust. And I wear it for a reason, because it, uh, it puts me in touch with my child. It reminds me of a gentle part of me that I tend to forget at times when I travel, drive, think, just generally associate with people. <laughs> Happy birthday to all the birthday people. And uh, it's kind of nice to be back after um, so many years. I forget the last time I was here. It's a long time ago. Uh, I know I've changed. I hope those of you who were here then have changed. Uh, I was looking at this sign, a, a little gathering of men and women happy in their relief. <laughs> I have never seen a little group of men and women in AA happy in their relief. Uh, most, <laughs> most release I see is after near death. <laughs> Anything I want is usually drug ripped from my bleeding fingertips. Um, for those of you who have heard me talk before or heard my tapes, you've heard me talk for years about the committee, all of the voices in the mind that have generally devoted a great deal of every waking day to trying to destroy me ever since I first got sober. And uh, I'm delighted to report now at 21 years I have gotten down to four. It uh, certainly makes life a lot more peaceful, you know, and it's uh, easy to deal with now because each separate part of me has an identity, and an identity that I can cope with. And if you are so insane as I have been in sobriety, where you are able to put chairs in a circle at home and have a meeting alone <laughs> by yourself, moving from chair to chair, <laughs> something to do in the middle of the night, you know, when you can't quite sleep, uh, it's a relief to be down to just four, you know, it's, it's true peace of mind. I'm sure it would scatter some so-called normal people, whatever they may be, but, uh, uh, and the four are very distinct personalities, the, the, and I'll share them because for me it's been a critical part of my recovery. And the first one is the child, who is a little guy in here, and he's very gentle. Ah, good, silent. <laughs> And he's, he's a very soft, very fragile little child. He needs great loving care, because he never got any when he was small. He, he grew up in a typical alcoholic household. He had a father who was an alcoholic and a mother who was an extreme neurotic. And uh, he didn't have a chance, you know. I mean, it wasn't really what he asked for, and uh, it's what he got. And we'll get into that later. <laughs> the second personality is an adolescent. I don't know how many of you are in touch with a teenager living inside your somewhat older body. But I can assure you, he's a pain in the ass. <laughs> he's a never-ending source of fun for me. Uh, about three years ago, I got him a Corvette, right? I said, well, you know, you deserve a Corvette. I'm going to get you a Corvette. You know, you've been pretty good. So I got him a Corvette. The problem with that was when I got him this car, I was a safe driver. I mean, I was on preferred insurance. Okay? <laughs> it had taken me 18 years of sobriety to get on preferred insurance. I had to live down 502s, felony drunk drivings, hit and runs, the list of... I mean, if I was could crawl, I would drive, you know? I mean, it never was an issue as to whether or not to drive. So I had an incredible driving record. They just wouldn't take it off. And it was lawyers and bullshit with the Department of Motor Vehicles. And it went on forever. And finally, I'm a safe driver. And I got my adolescent at Corvette, and I'm back on assigned risk again. <laughs> Son of a bitch just kept getting tickets. <laughs> His last one was in Kalinga, so I wasn't too heartbroken when the town fell down. <laughs> with a $150 ticket. That's enough to rebuild one store with, for Christ's sake. 
The adolescent also doesn't fully understand that he's in a 47-year-old body. He hasn't accepted that, and he seems to refuse to. He still seems to think that he has the cap capabilities that he had when he was very young. And I discovered, in, and I started to run back about November, and, and I discovered in running, I run at a high school sometimes in the morning, and I can tell what kind of day I'm going to have just by what transpires when I run at this high school, see? Because if I'm running around the track in the morning and one of the gym classes is out, Beverly Hills High, and the girls are out running in their little dolphin shorts doing their, you know, dutiful laps, if I view them with the sense of a mature adult, you know, here are young ladies, young, young women about to blossom into, you know, full-grown womanhood and bless them and their children, I know I'm going to have a rather wonderful day because the adult is in charge and it will be a quiet day, a peaceful day, a mellow day, you see. But if I'm cruising the track and I have this image of them as potential dates, <laughs> it's going to be a long fucking day, you know. It's, uh, because <clears throat> the adolescent will give you a whiplash, too. The guys understand this. You know, you're driving down the street, and the adolescent, <laughs> you know, he just can't, <clears throat> can't get up. And he doesn't want any responsibility at all. He wants zero responsibility in life. He wants nothing to do with anything that represents responsibility. I think his biggest goal is what it once was and what it always has been. What he really wants to do is find one giant breast encased in a cashmere sweater that he can that he can fondle behind a locker door in the hallway, you know, at school. That's like, he was, he was, you think I like giving this shit up, you're crazy. But I found out if I don't share me, we got nothing going on here. So it's like, that's all he's ever wanted, and it still seems to be his son total goal in life. The third personality is the adult. He and I are relatively new acquaintances. <laughs> we haven't known each other long at all, actually a few months to be, uh, maybe a year. And I find uh, a, a very gentle man, a very peaceful, uh, very uh, considerate man, a, a, a guy I would like to know. It has, it has affected my life a lot, just getting in touch with this person. Because see, I've always lived with somebody I hated, me. You know, and that's a tough lifestyle. And I see everybody, or most people I know, go through it in sobriety. It is that no self-esteem, it's the self-hatred, it's no use for yourself. And you're stuck, because when you go home, the very person you got is you. And we, you know, we say about the, uh, the alcoholic and his loneliness, you know, we talk a lot about the loneliness of the alcoholic. And, it, and it's true, but one of the things that I've discovered lately is that I spent about 17 years in sobriety totally out of touch with my feelings, okay? I sat in AA meetings and I would listen to people talk. I was 15 years sober and I'd sit in a meeting and I'd listen to somebody get up and say, well, today I was at work and the boss said, rap him out, and he hurt my feelings. And I sat in a meeting and I literally did not know what they meant. My feelings were buried so deep, you couldn't get to them if you wanted to get to them. And I had no comprehension of what these people were talking about. And I used to watch guys, and I'd, they'd get all upset over something, and the tears would come, or anger would come, and they'd just really go on. Or I would be in a relationship with a woman, and she'd start to express some feelings, and I'd have to change them for her. <laughs> you know, it's like... No, no, you don't feel that way. No, no, no. Let me tell you how you feel, you know. <laughs> I'm going to put you in a frame of reference I can understand, see, because I don't, I don't understand my feelings. And then I realized that I have spent the last four years getting in touch with my feelings. I understand why the alcoholic is so lonely, see? Because it's like, if you go home alone and you're not in touch with your feelings, any feelings, when you sit down, nobody's there. I mean, no one is home, just the voices. And they are rather empty, you know, they don't give you any, certainly not a sense of well-being, you know. When's the last time you sat around thinking and this sucker was telling you how good looking you are and how well your life is gonna go, you know. How much happiness and prosperity you're going to enjoy over the next few months once you get over the cancer and get a job. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> 
the fourth, the fourth voice is still that one son of a bitch that is out to kill me. He is against anything I want to do that is good for me or others, but particularly me. I mean, he wants nothing. He, I can't do anything, particularly anything new or different or change. You know, I, I heard a line the other day that is really wonderful. It just stopped me cold. There is absolutely no pain, listen carefully to this because you're not going to like it, there's absolutely no pain in change, none, and there is no pain in growth, none, zero. The pain is in the resistance to the change and the pain is in the resistance to the growth. And if you think about it for a minute, if you've been sober a little while, the minute you become willing and you let go, the pain goes away. It doesn't matter if you're moved to a new town, if you're moved to a new job, in or out of a relationship, it doesn't matter what happens in your life. Once you just let go and go for the change, the pain is gone. The pain is in the resistance, see? And I resist anything new. I'm into the old, the familiar, you know. Yeah, sure, I'd like to go, you know, meet those people, but I gotta, Go back here and stay home and talk to me. <laughs> Some of definitely the most worthless conversations I've ever had in my life, you know. I mean, I've never been an alcoholic. Most alcoholics, 90% of the ones I've met are, have minds just like mine. So we really understand each other. Even though you try and bullshit me, I know you're Looney Tunes, see? <laughs> Doesn't matter what kind of a front you put up. I know, see, because I've been around here too long and I've talked with too many people. I know that just getting out of the house in the morning is a bitch. You know, I know that you wake up with the voices talking to you immediately, you know, right? First thing in the a.m., the voice says, oh, good, glad you're awake. <laughs> I've been waiting to talk to you, you know. <laughs> Like the son of a bitch has been up all night, just, you know, a vulture on the headboard looking down, waiting. Ah. And the very first thing it'll tell you, it doesn't, it doesn't matter, it does not matter how much sleep you have had, it will tell you you have not had enough. Yeah? Ah, oh, Jesus, you're really tired today. You're not going to be able to do well at all. If I was you, I wouldn't go to work today. But then if you don't go to work, they're going to fire you. But if you go as tired as you are, you're going to fuck up, they're going to fire you anyway. So now that you lost your job, how are you going to handle it? <laughs> you don't have enough money to last four weeks, you know. <laughs> you're in a lot of trouble, son. <laughs> you know that bruise down by your knee? That's not a bruise, that's bone cancer. <laughs> So you've been awake about seven seconds, you know, right? You're in a sweat, you've lost your goddamn job, you got cancer, you're broke, you know. And people wonder why the alcoholic doesn't jump out of bed and greet the fucking day, you know. <sighs> you know. Isn't this terrific, you know? One more day of life to live, filled with... I mean, I don't know anybody that wakes up with the voices saying, Oh, God, cheery morning, you know. We get to go do it all again today. Isn't life wonderful? You know, I still wake up sometimes in a cold sweat. Just total perspiration. The difference is now I know it's all bullshit. See? So they still talk to me. This one negative voice is still there to wish me a good day, you know. <clears throat> but I have learned that probably the single most important thing to, to living life sober is a term called show up. Okay? So I show up no matter what this says. I've learned that it really lies a lot to me, you see. And I will show up, and I have to show up in little bitty steps, okay? I can't take the show up at work. Screw that. That's too far away, okay? That one can overwhelm me. I mean, I've been told by learned psychiatrists that he's being easily overwhelmed is part of our disease. It's a nature, part, part of what's wrong with us. So if I take it that I've got to show up at work, I can be really easily overwhelmed. So I pull all that back in and I just show up in front of the mirror and shave, <laughs> right? If I can get to the mirror and shave, then I can get to the shower. If I can get to the shower, I can get to the closet. Now the closet can be tough sometimes, you know. <laughs> you, picking the shirt can just send you into a cold sweat, you know. <laughs> Twelve shirts later, shit scattered all over the bedroom, you know. 
your hair's all messed up, you know. God damn. <laughs> what one do I wear, you know? Going to the firing squad, I gotta get, you know, <laughs> look good <laughs> when they give me the blindfold. <clears throat> so if I can get past that, then I try and get down in the garage at the car. If I can get in the car, I point the sucker in the general direction of where I work, and I'm off. You know, and if I get there, and I usually will, you know, 99 out of every 100 times, I have ever occasionally drifted off. Uh, once I show up there, it's never as bad as I've been told it's going to be. In fact, usually something wonderful happens. Something I would have missed if I hadn't have gone, which I understand was the goal of my friend here all along. You see. I read a, uh, a, a thing in a paper here a while back where a, a psychiatrist written a book and he said that the armchair is the neurotic spaceship. <laughs> <laughs> and for any of you who do any serious thinking, I know you can't identify with that, you know. Because the goddamn head never wants to go anywhere. Have you ever noticed that? It never wants to go anywhere. All it wants to do is sit and think, you know. <clears throat> it needs nobody to entertain itself. In fact, it would just soon not have people around because somebody might say something that would force you to look at reality. <laughs> You're sitting in a goddamn barbecue and it's on fire. Oh, I see, you know, I mean, it, it would rather just work things out, you know. <laughs> Screw the meeting, I'll solve this one. Sit down, everything will be okay. And the thing I've learned about my head is that um, it started on day one my very first meeting of AA. It didn't wait till I had 30 days or 60 days or 90 days or a year. It was waiting in the bushes for day one, you see. When I got here, <clears throat> I weighed about 135 pounds. I weigh about 175 now, so I was about 40 pounds lighter than I am now. You can imagine what a skeleton I look like at one, <clears throat> 135. I've been living outdoors, so I had a reasonably good coloring, you know. I was, I had the clothes on I'd had on for, I don't know, a few months, and that was my general condition, not too good, and the brains were fried from years of turkey basters filled with narcotics of various <laughs> assortments and degrees and mixtures. And so there was really not a lot left. I just kind of sat around, you know. And through a set of circumstances, Eskimos I call them, I wound up at my first meeting at AA, in this condition, mind you sat very carefully in a chair in Altadena, California, had a nice, charming little AA meeting, brought a cup of coffee, which was put in front of me on the table that I lapped up like a dog, you know, because I couldn't pick it up, because I was like this, you know. And after I got a little coffee in me, and I was aware that people were pretty quiet, I ventured to look around the room, you know, get the head off the chest, and looked around the room, and my mind says to me, this charming instrument, well, we have sunk to the fucking bottom this time. <clears throat> right? And it followed that by saying, this is the end of the road. Now, I want to tell you how lethal that is, okay? It sounds innocent enough because most of us aren't thrilled with AA when we arrive. No one I'm acquainted with has greeted this program with open arms, you know. Most of them were sentenced, drugged, beaten, or some otherwise gotten to a meeting. Hated everybody for years, and, you know, have just recently in their 15th year of sobriety come to accept it. You know, maybe they're going to have to stay here. So I don't know anybody that got here happy, but I'll tell you how d disastrous that end-of-the-road attitude is, okay? Because... In reality, we have in front of us, in the 12 Steps of Alcoholics Anonymous and the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous, we have got probably the single most powerful self-help program in the world, okay? Number one, no other program of any kind for any disease, any affliction, physical or mental, enjoys the success rate that AA enjoys, that this program enjoys. This is it. This is all powerful. But what my mind has said to me at my first meeting is, this is the end of the road. So now, from that, I can only draw this conclusion. This is something I do here between drinking and using and dying. Okay? So now that I can't drink and use anymore, I stay sober until I die. 
That's it. That's the sum good I'm going to get out of AA. It doesn't tell me that I'm going to have a happy life, a joyous life, that I can so totally change I'll hardly know myself, that I'll become a person I enjoy living with, that life is beautiful and wonderful, that I will be prosperous, that I will have a marvelous career, that everything is going to be outstanding. It has said, you just kind of hang out here until you die, sucker, and then you know that's it. <clears throat> well, how much energy do you put into a program if it's the end of the road, right? Somebody says, well, it's all over for you, as you know, fathead, but here's the book. This is the end. I mean, you know, you can go in people's houses and write your name on the covers of their book. It's so dusty. From no use. Why? Well, why use it if you're not going to get anything here, see? And that attitude is pretty easy to... I'll share it this way, only because <clears throat> it blew my mind. Because I began to get into a thing here a couple of years ago where I started looking around and based on the experiences I was going through, I became convinced that the number one problem of the addict and the alcoholic, both drinking and using and sober, is low self-esteem. None. We don't care about ourselves. And so about six months ago, to check this out, I had a couple of friends from back east, learned psychiatrists, highly qualified men, very brilliant, don't know anything about AA, have never been to an AA meeting. They're off into another field of psychiatry, totally. Dealing really with children. And a couple of guys who are very spiritual and have walked a spiritual path for more than 40 years. And to the best of my knowledge, neither one of them have ever drank or used anything of any kind. They were raised spiritually, grew up spiritually, and stayed on that kind of a path. So I'm dealing with the intellect and I'm dealing with very gentle souls. I mean, so peaceful, being around them will put you to sleep. You just kind of go, you know, like this. And I took them to, I think it was three AA meetings. <clears throat> Big meetings. I let them see a little bit about what AA was like. And then I said, I got them alone afterwards. And I said, okay, as outsiders, what do you think? I mean, what do you think of AA? Forget I belong. Just give me an honest appraisal of AA. And all four had the same response. And they were in shock, in shock at us. And here's what they said. They said, Jesus, you know, these people, by nature of a miracle, by nature of some sort of divine intervention in their life, have had removed from them a terminal illness. They have had taken out of their lives something that can kill them. It is gone. They are free from it, and yet they sit in the goddamn meetings and they continue to destroy themselves. <laughs> they said they smoke endless fucking packs of cigarettes. They drink coffee by the barrel. They eat sugar like it was health food or nuts or something good for you, right? And they get about as much sleep as a nocturnal goddamn guinea pig, you know. And I had to sit and listen to this appraisal of us while part of me was getting red with anger and this side of the neck was getting big, you know. And the other side was saying, you know what? They are absolutely right. They are correct. We do. We get freed from something that was absolutely destroying us and we continue to go right down the drain, you know? And I don't, why? What the hell went wrong? What happened that, that <clears throat> we can't come in here and have enough self-esteem that we're willing to go through a little physical discomfort for ourselves? Just a little, you know, that's really what it gets down to. I am unwilling to go through any discomfort to do something that's good for me. It's like, well, I quit smoking, but I have to go through the pain of withdrawal. You know the logic? Can you hear that? I mean, that's lunacy. I would really like to do something good for myself, but I don't want to do it. I'm... It's okay, fuck it. Yeah, I know the coffee's getting to me, but, you know. <laughs> Everybody drinks it, you know. And... I mean, the, the mind is so weak with the crap it comes up with, with why we should continue to destroy ourselves and yet we go for it. And that's the interesting thing. Why do we go for it? Why do we tolerate what the mind says? Uh, the thing that got my attention about smoking, and I'll share this one, <clears throat> is I was researching a suicide project. And I was at suicide prevention. I was sitting at a table with <clears throat> the people that run it. And I whipped out my Marlboros and lit one up. <clears throat> and it dawned on me there were no ashtrays. <laughs> 
and that no one else at this gathering was smoking. <laughs> and finally, the guy who was at that time the head of, of, of the Los Angeles chapter looked at me and he said, we have an official opinion on, on smoking, cigarette smoking, if you're interested. And before my head could get in there and stop me, I said, oh yeah, what is it, right? <laughs> big mistake <clears throat> the guy looked at me and said okay he said with all of the scientific information that is in with all of the technical information that is in it is now apparent that smoking is lethal that it is definitely dangerous to your health therefore after studying it we view smoking as covert suicide it is a little tiny gun with a little tiny bullet and every time you light one, you're killing yourself. Now, I left suicide prevention armed with that piece of information, and it fucked my smoking up for a year, you know. And I quit after that. I mean, I couldn't do it anymore. I was so aware. Suddenly, I was aware of what I was doing. Suddenly, somebody had hit me with, you're killing yourself. Why are you still killing yourself? Now, let's see if we can find out why I continue to kill me. <clears throat> because I didn't know any of this. I had, uh, let's see what time, I, um, in AA the first five years were, were a bitch, <laughs> to say the least, and I will just sum them up by saying that four years sober, I had done the very best job I could do with every area of my life, and I was bankrupt through the courts, lost my car, sleeping on a guy's couch, working in a car wash for a dollar and a quarter an hour, I had started at a dollar thirty-five, my... <clears throat> <laughs> My hemorrhoids are coming back from years of sitting on concrete in institutions by bouncing in and out off the hot car seats all day long. And I hadn't had a relationship in so long I had forgotten how, you know. I mean, I couldn't even get anybody to go to coffee with me, you know. You, you cross a line where they won't believe anything you say, you know, because they just see the look in your eyes and they know you're not sincere. <laughs> So that was my four years, you know. I mean, it's generally just a total goddamn disaster. I wouldn't even take a cake. My friend said, take a cake. And I said, why, you know? I mean, 12-step calls from central office. The guy had to be sober and have a car so he could pick me up so I could take him to the goddamn meeting, right? <clears throat> so I said, what the hell am I going to tell the newcomer? Come in here, hang on, give up your drugs and alcohol for four years, and you can have all of this, you know? I was happy and joyous and free life, right? So they gave me one in the Sunday morning meeting at the Glendale Sanitarium. They figured even there even my story was told, you know, because at least I was still outside. <clears throat> so I went through a year after that. It was about as much fun, but it got a little bit better because I hung on to a better paying job. And at the end of that year, approaching my fifth birthday, I was in a lot of misery and trouble. I wanted to die, and in essence, I was sitting around, for those of you who knew, keep coming back, you'll hear someone talk about drinking. Um, don't pay a lot of attention to what I say, it doesn't have to be this way for you. It is for everybody else, but it doesn't have to be this way for you. I, uh, at five years, two, two months prior to my fifth birthday in Alcoholics Anonymous, I wanted to die. I, uh, I had no desire to, 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 for those of you, uh, this sounds like a joke when I say it, and it really isn't, and it's not meant to be, but because for those of you who have been in this kind of depression, you will understand what I mean. The thought of suicide would have been a step up in the depression. It would have been an increased level of awareness, because I didn't have enough left to want to kill myself. I just wanted to sit still and die, right on the spot, <clears throat> you know, screw the impending fifth birthday I could have cared less less for the big nickel it didn't interest me at all death interested me in fact I never ever thought about suicide until I got sober <laughs> <clears throat> never entered my mind 11 years of drug addiction alcoholism never thought about killing myself so if you're in a little stress on your sobriety it's okay it's to be expected <laughs> And if you're not under a little stress, that's okay, too. You yeah. know, keep coming back. <laughs> and give up the grass. <laughs> the stress will come. <laughs> if you think speed was a high, wait till you hit the stress. <laughs> 
<laughs> I got to tell you, it'll get your whole body. <laughs> Misses nothing. And the intensity in the jaws is just as good as it was anyhow. So uh, I sat on this couch of mine in my apartment wanting to die. And I really didn't have a relationship with God. I had tried to get one, but I was very afraid of God because they kept saying God as you understand him. And the only God I understood was the old man who kept score, you know, sitting in the throne with the book. And, and any idiot knows that we're not even, right? You know, I mean, I wasn't even with the state of California. I knew I wasn't even with God. So I figured God is for the good people, you know, and he really doesn't work for those of us who are not that good. And it's like, also, somehow, I don't know where I got it, but I had this conception in my mind that in order to get God to work for me, I had to accomplish two things. One was I had to do a lot of penance in sobriety. I had to get good before God would help me. I have no idea how you do that, but that's what I thought I had to do was get good and then God would help me. And then the other thing I thought was that I would have to have the proper metaphysical terminology to talk to God. In other words, you couldn't just say, help. You know, it had to be some really flowery spiritual petition for assistance. You know, if when you have a moment, you know, most high deity, would you, whatever, the, I have no idea. It was another brainstorm of the mind, you know. <laughs> so anything to keep me from freedom and happiness. So sitting this night on this little in this little apartment of mine, almost five years sober, wanting to die, I made probably the single most profound spiritual prayer I have made in the entire time I have been clean and sober, all 21 years. I looked at the ceiling in my apartment and I screamed at the top of my lungs loud enough to draw the attention of the manager and the neighbors, which I've never mentioned before. I just said, God, if you're not there, I am fucked. <laughs> and then I waited. You know, like, <laughs> it's coming in a moment, I know, you know. <clears throat> he won't tolerate that. I know that, you know. Because <clears throat> that's what my head had me believing, you know. It's like, now you've really done it, sucker. Nothing happened. So I got up the next day, I went to work. I placed a brand new Allen head wrench into a brand new Allen head bolt tooled for perfect fit, non-slippage, right? It slipped, I went backwards against one of the furnaces, I was working as a die caster, crushed two vertebrae in my back, and I was taken to the emergency hospital. Now I'm laying in the emergency hospital in this little cubicle, and I have these doctors standing around me, talking to me, and they're saying things like, well, you can't lift anything heavy again, and you can't stand for long periods of time, and yet it, yet it, yet it, because my back is in terrible shape. I mean, I was totally insane when I was on the streets, and everybody came from behind, you know, so every night I ever got hit with anything, chains, pipes, bullets, they all came in the back, right? The pelvis has been snapped in half, put back together, so generally I'm, a, you know, and when you see me go tooling out of here to run, you're watching a miracle. <clears throat> so these doctors give me this, you know, prediction of, of hope, and walk out of this cubicle. And I'm laying there in my mind, this fine-tuned piece of machinery, says to me, see, you dumb son of a bitch, last night you surrendered, and today he broke your back. <laughs> I have been telling you for years to stay away. <laughs> and so from down inside here somewhere came a new voice, and it said to my head, it said, why don't you shut up? I thought, God, you know, I think I will. I am so tired of listening to those voices. So <clears throat> what I concluded laying there in the emergency hospital was this. I decided that maybe breaking my back was a good deal. Right? There was no evidence to prove it wasn't a good deal. Nothing. So I said, okay, this is God's will. My life is in perfect order, perfect order, no matter that it doesn't make sense. That has become the single most important prayer of my sobriety. Whenever anything is going on in my life, whether it's I have to face something new, whether things are in turmoil, whether everything is perfect, no matter what's going on, I just get really quiet and I say to myself, my life is in perfect order. 
even though it doesn't make sense to me. And I find out, pardon me, a very interesting thing. If I use that little prayer a half a dozen times a day, anything that isn't in order in my life is immediately corrected. What I need is added, what I don't need is removed, and I am put on a path. Somebody said one time, how do you tell God's will? How do you determine God's will? And the best answer I have ever heard in my life is, you go out the door and start moving, and when you hit a wall, you turn left. It may sound simple, but it's true. It's that simple, okay? So I leave this hospital deciding, okay, my back is broken. I gotta wear these goddamn braces and supports and things. <clears throat> and I'm just going to act as if it's okay. I'm going to do what's put in front of me to do. I'm going to file for vocational rehabilitation. I'm going to apply for disability insurance. I'm going to do those things that are put in front of me to do. And I go down and I get my disability insurance and I go to voc rehab and that becomes a horror story, right? <clears throat> because they don't know what to do with me. I don't have any education. I have no trade. I have no profession. I don't want, they want to send me to four years at UCLA and make me a psychologist to work with poor suffering alcoholic. And I said, I do that for nothing and I can't stand school. You know, what are you going to put me in school for? I, you know, I was fucking crazy in school when I was a kid. I'm not going back now. You know, I can see me on a college campus, right, with the little munchkins. It would have gone really well. <clears throat> so they said, well, you know, we got to find out what you're best suited for. So they gave me a battery of aptitude tests. I took one aptitude test each week for five weeks and came out something different each week, okay? I did not do that intentionally. I wasn't being cute. I wasn't being funny. I swear to God, I answered the questions on that given day as honestly as I could, how I felt. Yeah, I like this. I don't like that. I mean, have you ever really gotten in touch with your insanity, how you believe in both sides of any issue? <laughs> huh? I don't need anybody to debate with. No one. <clears throat> I can do it at home alone, you know. I can watch the news and take both sides of any issue, you know. Kill them, no, give them some help, send money, you know. <clears throat> so I had come out things like a forest ranger. I, I don't camp out and can't stand the outdoors. When I run out of asphalt, I get nervous, you know. <clears throat> so I knew that really wasn't going to be my chosen career. I came out mechanically inclined, which is really a lie, unless it's getting into somewhere and out quickly came out musically inclined, which is even a bigger joke than mechanically inclined, came out a social worker, that's humorous in light of the fact that the state of California labeled me a homicidal social psychopath, <laughs> which is not, I don't think, one of the prerequisites for a social worker. <laughs> I'm not sure what they are, but I have a strange feeling that's not one of them, you know. <clears throat> so anyway, months went by. This happened in July, I broke my back and they did not know what to do with me and I'd go get my check and I'd go meet with my counselor and I'd get my check and I'd meet with my counselor and get my check and meet with my counselor. And December rolls around <clears throat> and nothing's happened except I'm not wearing my brace on my back anymore. And they don't know what to do with me. And I'm sitting home one night and I'm reading TV Guy. <clears throat> and in TV Guy, I come upon this ad that says, would you like to be a writer? I thought, why not? It just felt like a good idea. It just made no sense at all. But it felt like a good idea. <clears throat> so I tear my little ad out of TV Guide, and the following day or two days later, whenever it was, when I go into vocational rehab, I take my little ad out of TV Guide, and I give it to my, re my counselor, <laughs> who's there to be supportive of anything I might want to endeavor, right? She laughs the goddamn hard. She almost fell out of her wheelchair, right? She thought it was hysterical because she knew a lot of things about me, you see. She knew I had a 10th grade education. She knew I had failed English ever since the fourth grade. She had all my applications in front of her. She knew I was a phonetic speller, right? I couldn't spell. She knew I had never read much of anything and didn't write anything very well at all. See? So she sort of thought it was really ludicrous, my little ad about wanting to be a writer. <clears throat> but God, in his infinite wisdom, had even beaten bureaucracy, okay? at their game because she took the ad in and gave it to her boss. Well, now remember, I signed up for Voc Rehab in July. This is now December. They have already placed everybody from October, right? 
I mean, I am the one black mark on the rolls of the Van Nuys office of Voc Rehab. I'm still there, and they've done nothing with me, right? This guy would have signed for basket weaving for me. He didn't care, right? He said, get him his books, sign the thing, and out the door I go, okay? <clears throat> now, I'm going to tell a little story so you understand about God and God's will, because this one's a bitch, right? I want to show you how difficult it is when you're on the right path, how many walls you run into. I send for my books, I get my books, <clears throat> I sit down, I start to try and write a short story, and it was really bad, <clears throat> terrible. But I'm reading my books, and I hit a book and it says, it's critical to the first new writer that they write for a medium that they're familiar with. And I thought, well, I never read much, but I have watched a lot of television. So I thought, okay, no short stories, we'll write a television story. So now I sit down and I try and write a story for Bonanza, and it was bad, I gotta tell you. <laughs> I mean, it was really bad. <clears throat> the idea was great, but the execution was terrible. I had, I just, it was terrible, <laughs> trust me. <clears throat> but I keep reading my books, and my books say not only is it critical that you write for a medium that you're familiar with, but it's also important to write about a topic you're familiar with. And I thought, oh, Jesus, I never lived in the Old West. You know, I don't know anything about the Old West. It's all right about crime, <laughs> right? I know about crime. Crime and I, you know, we're, we can do, don't have to do any research here. So, <clears throat> I watch the cop shows on TV and I zero in on Ironsides. And I say, all right, now what kind of a story would I like to see on Ironsides or a cop show that I've never seen before? I thought, well, I'd like to see one about a righteous payroll check passer, right? You know, I mean, I hung $35,000 worth of payroll checks one time and did a year for it. I made a small error in the end, the last few checks. <laughs> you only have to make one. Those son of bitches get to make 100, you know. <clears throat> so I thought, I'll write a story about a check passer. So I'm busy writing my little story about this check writer. And I come home from a meeting with a guy I've known for a couple of years, and I had made it a point in my sobriety because of the way I was wired to not know what people did for a living. I never asked. I never wanted to know what they did for a living because I could be affected by what they did for a living, you know, and treat them accordingly, you know. So, so if Max is a plumber and, and, and John is the vice president of Beverly Hills Bank, and Max and John both come up at opposite times after a meeting and want to go to coffee, <laughs> Max is screwed, you know what I mean? I'll fix my own plumbing, but I may need the bank someday, you see? <clears throat> so I will go with the banker. <clears throat> so I don't know what anybody does, and this guy brings me home from the meeting this night, and he drops me off at my house. I still don't have a car. Everything's still the same, still in the same apartment. And he says, what are you doing? And I said, oh, I'm trying to write a story for television. He said, he said oh, great, far out. He said, that's what I do. I said, what? He said, I write for TV. See how hard I had to look for him? Okay. See how much scheming, maneuvering, manipulating, planning, anguish, and pain went into finding him? I want to show you about God's path and how simple it is, okay? So he says, when you get done writing your story, if you like, I read it for you. Maybe I can give you some pointers. And I said, oh, great, right? So I finish the story. I give it to him. He reads it. There's about a dozen pointers he gives me. I like six of them, and I make the six I like, and I ignore the other six, <clears throat> which is, I found out, just a matter of creative choice, and it's fine. Now I'm all done with it. He says to me, look, there's a girl on the program who after work at night, she types on the side for extra money. Would you like her to type up the script for you? And I said, yeah, I would. I think somebody better. You know, I don't think Universal knows that dead is spelled D-E-D. <laughs> they probably would like to see the A in there somewhere, you know, and I'm not sure where it goes, which is why I leave it out, you know. <laughs> I have a dictionary at home for phonetic spellers. It's great the words are in there phonetically because a dictionary is no goddamn good to you if you can't spell. You know, it's the biggest joke in the world, right? I mean, if you're looking for a word like character and you can't hear the H, you're screwed. You know, you got to start at the beginning of the C's with a ruler and just <laughs> go until you find the words. Ah, you know, I got it, right? Maneuvering, manipulating, arranging, and pain went into finding her. The next step in this, remember, this is a total loser, guys. This is no education, you know, total wiped out, dope being alcoholic, wasted with zero self esteem. And the path is being put in front of me. She takes it in, she gives it to her boss. They read it, they like it, they call me in for a meeting. <clears throat> they want to buy it and do the script. Now, my friend Jim says to me, Okay, let me tell you what the meeting's going to be like. 
and he forgot I was a literal person. <laughs> it, it could have been a disastrous mistake. He said, now look, the guy's going to sit down and he's going to say to you, have you ever written a television script before? And tell him no. Tell him you've never written one, and that, <clears throat> but that, that doesn't matter, that you'll do a better job for him than his hacks at the studio, because it's more important to you than it is to them, and that they're only going to pay you $2,600 for the script, and they piss that much away on a mistake on every show. <clears throat> okay, I'm armed for my meeting. Two days later, I'm at Universal Studios riding in the elevator, going up in the Black Tower, right? talking to God in the elevator, informing him that if I, he doesn't get off the elevator with me, I am in more trouble <laughs> than I have ever been in in my life. <clears throat> so I get off, and I say, wait, and you know, I'm waiting to see this guy, and I'm just like, <clears throat> finally I'm in his office. Now I am dealing with, I don't know this, I have no idea, see, I got no information on this guy, I got no book on him. I'm dealing with one of the tyrants in the industry, but I don't know that. I'm dealing with a guy that everybody walks on eggshells around. I'm dealing with a guy who would destroy a career if he could, if you crossed him. Just a wonderful, charming human being, right? I sit down in his office and he says the exact opening line Jim said he would say. Have you ever written a script? And I looked him right in the eyes and I said, no, I haven't. As a matter of fact, I have never seen a script. I said, but I will do a better job for you than your hacks here at the studio. <clears throat> because it's more important to me than it is to them and you're only going to pay me 2600 bucks and you've pissed that much away on a mistake on every show. <laughs> Silence. Right. The longest five seconds of my life. And suddenly he starts to laugh, right? He can't control himself. Nobody has ever talked to him like that. You know? He can't believe this urchin from the street had come in <laughs> and said, what? <laughs> <You know. clears throat> so I write the script and it goes very well and they like it a lot and the show gets shot and they're really kind to me and they let me hang out for the six days with the director and it's, we get all done and it's all over and I go and see it <clears throat> and he says to me, okay, let's do another show together. Just go home, come back on Wednesday, I think it was, when I, was, I had like three or four days, I forget how long. Think a couple books, think of some ideas, come back and we'll do another show. Well, I mean, this is like seventh heaven. This is like the greatest gift in all of the writers. So I go home, right? Now, all I gotta do is come up with a couple of ideas. That's it. That's all, see? And I have here, mounted on my shoulders, a mind that has been talking to me without stopping, right? For 32 goddamn years it hadn't shut up. Not once had it ever gotten quiet. All I want from it now is two simple fucking ideas. That's it, right? You know what I get? Silence. I get silence deeper than I've ever been able to achieve in meditation. Nothing. You know, all I want is one idea. Nothing. You know, the only thing it says to me is, well, you've heard about those guys that write one book. You have just written your one TV show. I hope you've enjoyed it because it's over. <clears throat> well, comes Wednesday or whenever, and I got nothing. No idea at all. I literally don't have an idea. I've watched TV to look for ideas to steal. I mean, I, anything I could do, anything so I could go in with ideas, my career is over, you understand? But I learned one thing. Show up. Right? So I showed up in front of the mirror, and I showed up in the shower, and I showed up in the closet, and I showed up in the car, and I showed up at Universal Studios. And I ride in the elevator one more time, and I walk into this guy's office, and I know I am just about to have the single most humiliating experience of my life. And I sit down in his office in the chair, he says, well, you got any ideas, you know, for a show? And I go, well, I, uh, uh, it's been, uh, he says, well, look, never mind. He said, <clears throat> I've got an idea, he said. We've not been on the air long enough now, and we we're a strong enough television show. He said, I feel we have some responsibilities. And he said, I think as part of our responsibilities, he said, it's time for us to do a really serious look at drug addiction and the upper middle class teenager. And he says that to me, and I said to him, why the fuck couldn't I think of that? You know, I mean... <clears throat> I'm the dope fiend, for Christ's sakes. You know, I got this straight arrow sitting there in a goddamn chair giving me my whole life history, right? So I say to him, yeah, great idea. You know, 
See how hard I had to look for the idea? See how much scheming had to go in? I mean, I gotta tell you, man, when you're trucking on the path, it falls. And when you're not, it doesn't. Okay? So anyway, I said, look, here's what we got to talk about. We got to talk about right there. Just vomit on it. He says, wait a minute. He says, how do you know so much about drug addiction? I mean, have you, we all do this, but I won't judge you by it. I have a number of instances in my life where my mouth goes and I really wish it wouldn't, you know? <clears throat> I'm standing there listening to me talk thinking, God, I wish I could just drop dead right here, right now, or fucking disappear, you know? But this really isn't me talking, you know? So please understand that, you know? Anything, but it just goes on by itself, you know? So I figured this was one of the times that it had gone on by itself and it got me in a lot of trouble. So I figured one of my sponsors had taught me when, when caught, tell the truth. <laughs> so I was caught, right? So I said, well, look, I said, I'm a drug addict and alcoholic and I drank and used for 11 years and I've been clean and sober for uh, five, a little over five years through the combined programs of Narcotics Anonymous and Alcoholics Anonymous. He says, oh, that's great. And he goes right back to talking about the story. No big deal. And then about 10 minutes later in the conversation, he looks at me and says, would you be offended if we got a technical advisor for the show? I said, no, that's cool. We got a narc from the San Fernando Valley who I had taken a shot at. <laughs> we pretended the other did not exist for the whole show. We only said two lines to each other, right? I said, oh, it's still a cop, huh? <laughs> he said, ah, it's still alive, huh? We never spoke again. I was the writer when he was the technical advisor. It was interesting. <laughs> he hadn't learned to forgive and forget. <clears throat> so anyway, we did the show and it came out very well. Now we truck on down the high road of life and I go through life's experiences, a couple of marriage. I fall deeply in love with a woman who was probably the greatest lady I've ever known. And four months after we were married, she got, we got married, she died, which is a bitch of an experience. But I stuffed the grief at the time and I put it aside to relive last December, which I may or may not get to. But anyway, some of others' life experiences go on and I keep working as a writer and, and, and the career keeps going okay for me. But I don't have enough self-esteem to, to, to deal with money. I mean, I had, a, I had a way of dealing with money, which was spend it. It came in, I spent it. It didn't matter how much came in, I found I could spend it really easy. <clears throat> it wasn't difficult at all. So that whenever I was done with a project, I was always done and broke. I kept myself in that constant state of anxiety. It's like, <clears throat> I didn't deserve to have a little peace of mind. I didn't deserve to have some security of any kind. I just stayed <clears throat> right on the scale. So, one day, about <clears throat> 16 years sober, I guess. I don't remember. Right in there. I had a friend of mine come visit me at the studio. He was sober about as long as I was. But he's one of these guys that's not cool. You know what I mean? He gets excited over anything. <clears throat> he's gotten in touch with his child and his adolescent and his adults, and he's having a good time out there. He doesn't know that it's supposed to be miserable. <clears throat> he doesn't understand that you're supposed to look good at all costs. <clears throat> he has fun instead. <laughs> Participates in life. <laughs> he's the one that dropped the line on me that life is what's happening while you're busy making plans. <laughs> So he comes to the studio to visit me, and he's never been to a motion picture studio. Well, I might as well have a 10-year-old, right? <clears throat> I mean, this guy goes nuts, okay? I mean, he's, wow, oh, God, look, and screaming and shouting and carrying on. He'd see a star walking along, he'd say, oh, that's, what's her name? God, I love her, man, she's great. You know, I just, I'm just, uh, uh, you know, uh, I just want to hide somewhere, you know? And I think, God, i got to get him in the commissary for lunch, you know, and we'll, maybe he'll be quiet in there, you know, and I get him in the commissary and he's worse, you know. <clears throat> the guys from MASH come in and he says, oh, Jesus, MASH is my favorite show. Wow, that's the Reverend and that's Doc and, oh, Christ, there's Alan, oh, Jesus. You know what I mean? I'm like, oh, everybody's looking to see who this guy is, you know. And I'm like, get him out of the car. I ate lunch, passion out every lunch of my life. I mean, I was like, done, <laughs> right, you know. Are you ready? <laughs> you know. <clears throat> So I get him out of there and I take him down to a stage where they're doing a special effects stunt. They do this incredible piece of special effects and it's all done. And this meathead walks up to the special effects guy and says, how did you do that? Right? And I was surprised. The special effects guy was delighted to tell him. 
He says, oh, well, we did that. Yeah, blah, blah, blah. Even he was thrown there. Somebody else. He got all done. Now I knew how. See, I didn't know how they did it either because I never asked. You know. <clears throat> I never asked because looking good is, you don't ask and look good. You know what I mean? So looking good is more important than knowledge. Fuck knowledge when you can look good. You know. <clears throat> Well, I learn anything, you know. <laughs> so finally I get him out of the studio, gone. And I'm sitting in my office, and I'm uncomfortable, and I'm angry. And I think, this son of a bitch just had more fun with my career in four hours than I have had in ten years. He got more enjoyment, more pleasure, more laughter, more thrills, and more excitement out of my career in one afternoon than I had gotten the entire time I had been in it. Because I couldn't let myself feel anything that was going on. I always was listening to the mind. I drove into the studio every morning expecting my parking place to be gone, you know? No more sign that I had ever been there, right? Your job is over, Robert. Goodbye. I never drove in. I came, in fact, I was here one time. I came over here and spent three weeks, and I had, just before I left, I had to write a script in a hurry for a show. <clears throat> I had four days to do it. So I did the script in four days, turned it in the studio, jumped on a plane, and came to Honolulu, right? I figured I didn't want to be around. <clears throat> so I was staying with a friend. I've been here maybe three, four days. We come home from the beach one day, and there's a letter in the mailbox. I'd give them a phone number and address where they could get them, and there's a letter in the mailbox from the producers, right? I'm standing in the driveway holding this letter, and I'm thinking, oh, Jesus, right? I mean, I'm, like any good alcoholic, I'm reading through the envelope. <clears throat> I know what the letter says. <clears throat> I know it says, that's probably the worst script we have ever read in our lives. Not only will you not write for this show or this studio again, if we have anything to say about it, you'll never write in this town again. I mean, I know what it says. I'm sitting there reading it through the envelope. And a girl with me finally makes this idiotic suggestion. She says, why don't you open it? <clears throat> so I open the envelope and the letter says, it's from the producers of the show, and it says, we wanted to take time out to tell you this has got to be one of the two finest scripts that have ever been written for this show. And because you dealt with it with such sensitivity and such love, it was interesting enough about, it was a Starsky and Hutch, it was about his girlfriend dying. <clears throat> it said, so that was close to home. He said, because you handled it with such delicacy, we are not going to rush it to production. We will wait till you return from Hawaii to make the necessary changes, and then we will shoot it with the care and the attention that it deserves. My immediate response to that was, well, at least they aren't pissed off. Okay? Now that's sad. That is so tragic, it's unbelievable. It is so goddamn pathetic that I can't stand in the middle of that driveway, receive a letter like that in my field or my profession or what I do from people who are judges of my kind of work praising me, saying I've written one of the two best shows they've ever had on the series, that I can't jump up in the middle of the driveway and go, yeah, I am a good writer. No, all I can say is at least they aren't pissed off and go on about my day. Well... This kind of attitude led to continuing discomfort, <laughs> to say the least. So when I rolled into year 17, I had reached a point where I had done it as good as I could do it with this program. I had written all the inventories I could write. I had worked all the steps I could work. I had spoke all the times I could speak. I would donned all the institutions I could go to. I had done everything I could do with this goddamn program, and I was still something was wrong. A piece of me was missing, and I didn't understand what these people meant when they talked about feelings, because I didn't know what the hell they were. So a friend of mine suggested to me, perhaps I should see a therapist. And I said, I think that's an outstanding idea. I shall do it immediately, because I had watched somebody I know go through it, and I watched the changes, and I thought, God, if they can help her, you know, they can help anybody. <clears throat> I was really true. So I went to her. I said, who is your therapist? You know, and she said, so-and-so. I said, great, I'm going tomorrow. You know, give me the number. I will call. And, you know, you'll hear a lot of bullshit in AA about therapy. And if you're in it or thinking about going, anybody, just give them this. I don't give a fuck if they're 30 years sober. You know, Bill Wilson was in therapy, needed it critically at four years of sobriety. He was in therapy for 16 years. 
So let's not hear any bullshit, guys. It's in the book, and I'll be delighted to show it to anyone who would like to take me on over the issue of therapy after this meeting. Just bring me a big book and an AA comes of age, and we'll sit down and discuss it. So anyhow, because I think it's criminal that we're trying to keep any kind of tool from anybody, because it's all it is is a tool. It's another tool, and it's a tool I needed desperately. Really needed desperately. In 17 years, I don't think if I found it, we would be having, I wouldn't be here tonight. <clears throat> so I sit down with this therapist for our first meeting, this lady, because I had a lot of relationships that had gone in the toilet. <clears throat> and I figured I might as well get a woman for a therapist. Maybe I'll learn something here. And she says, well, tell me a little bit about yourself. Start with your childhood and just fill me in, right? So I said, well, you know, when I was <clears throat> 15 years of age, they threw me out of Maine Arts High School. <clears throat> And I have discovered the wonderful world of drugs and alcohol. And I drank and used for 11 years, dealt narcotics, and just generally, you know, terrorized the streets until I was 26 and I came to AA and I've been clean and sober for 17 years. She looked at me and she said, no, no. She said, wait a minute. She said, I said, start with your childhood. She said, your childhood didn't, you weren't born at 15 years of age. I said, well, I don't remember my childhood. I don't remember anything back past 15 years of age. And she got that great look <laughs> that the learners get when they know they've got, you know, a ripe one, right? I can, <laughs> you know, I can write a paper on this sucker, you know. <clears throat> and so she said, well, I think it'll probably be beneficial for you and for me if we can discover what went on back there, right? And I had always thought, what has that got to do with anything? You know, I'm here today, I'm clean and sober today, being a kid got nothing to do with what I'm going through today. Did that keep me in misery for a long time? <clears throat> so, any, and the reason I never thought anything about it, although I probably have written 130 goddamn inventories, is I took all my inventories with my sponsors, all of whom also can't remember back past 15 years of age, right? So it didn't, what well, didn't seem strange to them, they, it was fine. It's exactly where their life started at 15. Oh yeah, all right. You know, nobody ever said what happened when you were four or two or three or eight or ten, twelve. You know, what was adolescence like? <laughs> you know. I chose not to even experience it. You know, I went for morphine instead. <clears throat> so, <laughs> that's true. I don't know you advise an adolescent about their adolescence when we've all lived ours, you know, at 30, 40 years of age. <laughs> so anyway, this lady and I go to work on finding out what the hell happened back there when I was a kid. To sum it up, to not bore you with the details, I can say that my parents were smart enough to never get a dog. <clears throat> you see, because they knew a dog would be too much work. <laughs> so they had a kid instead. I was blessed. I was chosen to experience all that they had experienced. Now, in AA, what we hear around here, which is really interesting, is people say, well, you got to forgive your mom and dad did the best job they could with the information they had. I heard that when I was in AA, and I said, yeah, great, mom and dad did the best job they could with the information they had, forgave them. Went right on destroying me, keeping myself in, you know, continuous self-destruction, no self-esteem, just screwing up my life, meaningless relationships, not experiencing feelings, 17 years of sobriety, but half of it was half dead, right? But I forgave them, see, because they did the best job they could. Well, let's talk about the job they did for a minute, because it's critical. It is absolutely critical to me. I started to try and run uh, and get into running about two and a half years ago. And I got caught up with guys that ran a lot faster than I did. They, were the, they all qualified for Boston. I had no business being with them, but they were intense alcoholics, and they also didn't have enough sense to let me be. So I spent a lot of time tired and blistered and injured or asleep or just generally it wasn't going well. I was having a lot of trouble with my feet, needless to say, with this body I've got. <clears throat> I have a, a, my own gait. <laughs> and I had three different pairs of shoes being neurotic, one for each surface, you know, one, one for asphalt, one for dirt, one for grass, right? What can you do with a neurotic, you know? I mean, it's got a lot of personalities, you have to buy them shoes. So. <laughs> It's like raising a family, you know. You go out in the morning, come on kids, let's go run, you know. <clears throat> so uh, I'm running with this one guy one morning, he said, look, what you gotta do is you gotta go see this podiatrist in Long Beach. 
He will make for you a pair of things called orthotics. These orthotics, in essence, are going to balance out your foot stripe, and they'll make every pair of shoes identical. So when you go from one pair to the other to the other, you're not going to have this terrible blistering problem you have. And the guy's a marathoner himself. He understands. Well, I was living in Santa Monica, you know? And Long Beach is a long way from Santa Monica. So I said, screw it. I'm going to go over here to Century City. It's closer. All right? Listen carefully, because this is incredible what we will do to ourselves. So I go over to Century City. I mean, why go to the best when Century City is closer? So I go over to Century City, and I go to this podiatrist in Century City, and I said, well, I'm trying to run, and I need orthotics made, and yada, yada. He says, oh, I don't make them. He said, but I have a girl who's going to be in the practice with me in a month. She makes them. I said, oh, okay, great. I'll wait. So I waited. Now, normally, under any other circumstances other than something good for me, I guess, the minute he says, no, I don't make them, I would have understood that was a wall. Right? I had just hit a wall, and the best thing I can do now is turn left and keep going. I wait right here at the wall. You know. <clears throat> I'll wait for her. It's okay, you know. Fuck life, I'll just stay here, you know. <clears throat> so she shows up in a month, makes me a pair of orthotics. I go out, I finally get them, I get in my shoes. I go out, I run three miles, go home, sit down, drink a can of tab, get up and can't walk. All right? Absolutely have just totally thrown out my whole lower back because they were made wrong. Now I'm out trying to run with this back, limping down the path, and my friends, again, being supportive, say, look, you got to go over to Pasadena, man. The best sports medicine doctors in Southern California are in Pasadena. They work with runners. They'll run with you. They'll spend time with you. They will fix your back. They'll have you straighten out in no time. I go home, and I think about it for a minute, and it's like, <clears throat> God, if Long Beach is far, Pasadena is further. You know what I mean? So the tragedy here is, if you came to me and said, I have injured my back, the doctors I have been advised to go to are in Pasadena, would you please drive me? I would drive you. I would get in my car and take you. The person I won't take is me. <laughs> See? Because I ain't worth taking to them. So I go to a chiropractor in the marina, <clears throat> right, who's 40 pounds overweight, and his eyes glaze over when you mention the word running. I mean, he doesn't even know, right? He would put my back in. I'd go run nine miles. It'd go out. I'd come back. He'd put it in. I'd go run. It'd go out. I'd come back. I mean, we went through this for a month, right? Finally, pain, desperation, and I can't stand it anymore, and a little piece of guidance from my therapist. I went to Pasadena, <laughs> right? I finally got in my goddamn car and drove me to Pasadena. And I got to Pasadena, and the guys were great, and they got, got me straightened up enough that I felt like I could walk, and so now I said, well, I'm on a roll. I will go to Long Beach. <laughs> and I get down to Long Beach, and I take my shoes off, and I'm sitting there waiting for this podiatrist, and he looks at my feet, and he looks at my right foot. He says, Jesus, he says, no wonder you're having problems. Your right foot is practically a club foot. I said, I said, what? He said, yeah, look, see how it just lays over and curls in? And I'm, sit, I'm sitting there, you know, I look my feet out on the thing, looking at his foot, and I'm, I'm going, I don't, don't feel well. So, you know, it's like, I get this really sick feeling. And I said, well, when did it happen? You know, I said, I mean, I was in a <clears throat> severe automobile accident that ripped my pelvis in half once, and, uh, you know, I've taken a bullet through that knee, and, I mean, he says, no, it's from when you were a kid. I said, oh. And I leave, and I drive home to Santa Monica, and I don't feel good, and I'm, I'm like, I feel funny. I feel just kind of sick and just a little angry. I get home, and I'm sitting home, and... I'm looking at my foot, and, I, and I, it's like I can't connect it. It's like something in me is trying to connect it, and I can't connect it. And my mother called. I love God. I mean, God's timing is so wonderful. And she had just come from her podiatrist, right? He's great. And she's bitching about how he had cut her toenails wrong, you know. And when she gets done with her standard line, <clears throat> I said to her, Look, as long as we're on the subject of feet, <clears throat> 
did I ever have any feet problems when I was a little child, when I was small? She said, oh, yeah, yeah, you did. She said, you had very, very high arches as a child, and we had to buy you specially made shoes when you were little. They were very expensive shoes. And in the next five minutes of our conversation, she must have reiterated another six times how expensive these shoes were that they had to buy for me when I was a child. I hang up the phone from the conversation with my mother, and I want to throw up. And I'm half homicidal and half sick. And I don't know what's going on, except I'd like to kill somebody, and I think it's her, but I'm not sure. <clears throat> And I'm not even sure why, and the other half of me would like to just go in the bathroom and vomit, and I don't know why. And so the next morning I have my therapist, and I get with her, and I said, look, here's what's going on, yada da yada da yada da And she said, well, let's go back, you know, let's get quiet, lay down. She said, let's go back. Let's find out what's back there. Let's see what the hell this is all about. And so we went back, and back, and back. And what we found was this. <clears throat> we found an absolutely adorable little boy, right? about two and a half years old, blonde, curly hair, standing in the hallway in Denver, Colorado, in his little shoes, with tears streaming down his face. And he was talking to his mother, and he said to his mother, my shoe, my foot hurts, my right foot hurts because my shoe is too small. My shoe hurts. And his mother is saying to him, shh, not too loud. Your father might hear you, and he will be very angry if we have to spend him more money new shoes. Now, I understand. If I am not worth buying a pair of shoes for that fit, guess where I got my low self-esteem? The two single most important people in my life as a child can't put shoes on me that fit. What the fuck am I worth? I, now I know when I have the basic a feeling or opinion about myself that I'm a turd. I mean, that's generally how I felt about myself. So, <clears throat> what I've learned is this, which is really interesting. It's very true. I will stand here today. I still have, my father's dead. The disease killed him. I still have a lot of difficulty with my mother. I mean, I can, 90 minutes is tops. 91 and I'm ready to kill her, right? So I go visit for 90 minutes once every six months, maybe, and I'm gone. Because that's the best I can do right now. But yeah, I will honestly say this. My mother and my father did the very best job they could do. They put on to me exactly what was done to them. They did to me what was done to them. They couldn't have done it any better on a bet. They had only X amount of information, and they raised me with X amount of information. But that's only half the issue, guys. That's just half of it. And if we look at just that half, we're in a lot of trouble, see? Because that's one half. They did the best job they could. The other half is over here. The reality is they did a rotten fucking job. An absolutely horrible job. A criminal job. Okay? And if I just look at this half, I start thinking I'm wrong and they're right. Okay? The best example of this I know of recently it was a while back, a gal on the program was celebrating her first birthday. And her mother, who's also on the program, is four years sober, called her. Listen carefully to this conversation. Her mother says to her on the phone, Look, the only thing I can give you at this time in your life right now is to tell you that I am fully aware that I am responsible for the majority of the problems that you have in your life today. I understand I am responsible. And she said, but for your sake, please understand, you are responsible for the solutions to those problems. And that's what we're here. And that's what we're about here. You know? I had no desire to turn out the way I turned out. Man, it wasn't my idea to run the fucking streets with guns trying to kill people. Because a lot of my, I know a lot of people like to be my mother. <laughs> you know. <laughs> they like to discuss what happened to them with her, you know. You raised an angry, angry child, dear. <laughs> then somebody gave him a gun. <clears throat> what well, has come out of all this awareness? What has come back in the, going back into the childhood and find out I was raised in a house that could only accept silence? No wonder I didn't have my goddamn feelings, right? I'm raised in a house with a totally neurotic woman, a, an alcoholic father who never was sober, ever, and they never raised their voices. 
The only thing permissible in my house was silence. Silence was golden. If I didn't talk, didn't feel, especially didn't express any feeling, no, no emotional highs or lows. I mean, don't laugh loud and don't cry. Just, mm, no wonder I went to drugs. You know, mm, you know, I was, I, every time feelings would start to come up, every time I start to feel anything, I went for the, mm, you know, let's stop this shit. Let's get it down here, you know, level where I can deal with it. Because I wasn't allowed to express anything. I wasn't allowed to be happy or I was never allowed to be a kid. You know, I'm 47 years old. I got to be a kid today. You know, I brought a teddy bear with me on the trip. He's in my room. You know, you're walking to meet him after the meeting. You know, my bears are giving me a sense of uh, my child loves bears, so I let my child have bears. He's a, uh, he's a great bear. He's like it. <laughs> that little Hawaiian shirt on, white shorts. <clears throat> he's, he's called it Aloha Bear, right? I had all these bears on the bed. I have one bear who's my oldest. He's six years old, and he, he travels with me all the time. And his name is just Bear. I don't have a lot of imagination for a writer. And Bear always travels with me. So I'm, I'm getting ready to come to Hawaii. I've got this little Hawaiian bear who's never been to Hawaii, see? And the little Hawaiian bear wants to come to Hawaii so he can be real. I mean, he can be official once he's been here. He can really be an aloha bear. But I got bear who, you know, always goes, see? So I have to deal with them. <laughs> when I finally explained to bear there wasn't enough room for both of them in the suitcase, you know, it was okay, see? Because bear has been to Hawaii before. <clears throat> That's my child, see? And I have to allow that in my life today. Yeah, I work in a major motion picture studio where they pay me an awesome amount of money for what I do, and I have a great deal of respect for who I am. And, oh, yes, Mr. Earl, you know, and I go home and talk to my bears. I have two bears on my desk, <laughs> you know. And nobody says anything. They figure, oh, hey, let him have his bears, you know. <laughs> He's not hurting anybody, you know, screw it. <laughs> so that's the, that's, anyway, that's the gentleness. Where was I? Got my bears. Oh. The results of all <clears throat> the results of all this is I have learned that that I didn't have it coming. I did not have it coming. Nothing that transpired when I was a child did I deserve it. None of it. None of it. Didn't ask for it. No child deserves it. And it shouldn't have happened to me. So now that little piece of information has set me free to be me. See? Because I have not liked me for the seventeen years I was sober before I started therapy. People used to say, well, go home and look in the mirror and say, I love you. And I would go home and look in the mirror and say, oh, fuck you. you know, <laughs> some endearing phrase, you know, but I couldn't say, I love you. You know, that's not the shit heel here. Let's not be ridiculous, you know. You know, talk like that to jerks, you know. I mean, that's how I thought. That's how I true. I think about it. If anybody said to you, if anybody on this planet said to you what you say to you about you, you would kill them. If anybody talked to you or put you down, constantly got in your way, like you get in your own way, like you put yourself down, I'm too thin, I'm too fat, this isn't right theological, this isn't bad, that's always, it's never, man, no, you're never just okay, you know, you're never, because it's always, if you don't have any self-esteem, you can't be okay, because you're always trying to, like my parents were always worried about what people thought, Jesus Christ, take that one to the grave with you, you know, so the thing that I have discovered is that I'm okay, see? And out of all that has come, you know, we talk a lot about AA, about the newcomer is the most important person in the room, okay? Yeah, my, my opinion is, and this is just my opinion, the, the newcomer is the most important person in the room if you view AA like a furnace that, that needs coals to keep it going, you know what I mean? Because whether you can accept this or not, the single most important person in this room sits in your chair. There is nobody in this room, I don't care if they got 30 fucking seconds of sobriety, that's more important than you are. Nobody. Because if you don't take care of you, you're not going to have, not, we're not going to be here to have a program for the newcomers anyway. And I, by taking care of me, I am a better example each and every day of, of the power of this program and what you can have here, you know, of what, of what is available. And it's not by, by my, uh, I had a conversation with a friend, okay, um, <clears throat> I, had a, I had a conversation with a learned friend out, out, outside of the program of Alcoholics Anonymous and I asked him how they, you know, viewed recovery. And they said, well, what they see is, and they, they, they know a lot about the program, and they said, what they see is when the person first comes into AA, they are rescued. 
literally rescued, which is as it should be. I mean, we are, we are just picked up and rescued. We are told where to sit, we're brought coffee, we're, you know, told what meetings to go to, and people pick us up and take us here, listen to us cry and snivel and yada yada. We're rescued. We're just taken care of. And then after we get a little bit of sobriety, we turn around and we rescue others. We pick them up, we bring them home, we feed them, we tell them where to sit, we get them coffee, you know, we, we rescue them. And she said, then now, she said, the next step in a healthy recovery is you must now accept responsibility for your own life. You must finally realize that no one is going to do it for you. There is no Prince Charming, there is no Princess Grace. There is nobody's going to come along. I mean, the magic lady with a million bucks and the Rolls Royce isn't going to show up and fix it for me. And Prince Charming ain't going to come along and make it okay for you, right? Because his horse is going to shit in your driveway and it's over, okay? <laughs> and if you remember, most of us are still trying to work it out with our moms. You gals will take another look at us entirely. Yeah. <laughs> we aren't looking for partners <laughs> or looking for mom. <clears throat> the first one blew it. We want one that'll do it right. <clears throat> So you accept, she says, you accept responsibility for your own life, and from that point on, what you have to offer is you can tell anyone how you got to where you are and hope that they can take and follow those same steps, but you can't do it for them. And she said, I see the, the most, she said, the most common pattern I see, she said, is people in the program get caught up in the rescue rescuing. And I thought about it, and I thought, Jesus, she's right. I mean, I know people 15 years sober who will listen to somebody on the phone, you know, in their hysterical conversation, solve their problems for them, hang up, pick the phone up, and dial their sponsor, and go through the same bullshit only their own. You know, it's like a vicious cycle. It's like they haven't yet stepped out. And so what has happened to me as a result of the information is, I have finally reached a point where I have had to learn I'm it. You know, I'm all I've got. And the interesting thing I've discovered by arriving is that if I'm okay, you know, I'm really a good guy. I mean, you should see my place where I live. First of all, my plants are all alive. Now, <clears throat> I gotta, I gotta explain to you what that means that my plants are all alive. Because a plant, up until about a year and a half ago, never stood a snowball's chance in hell in my house. If you gave me a plant, it was sentenced to die. Okay, Be because a plant required water. And water meant attention, giving something to something else. And if I can't give to me, I can't give to something else. So everything always died. I had a baby bring me this great fern one time, big, beautiful fern, on my birthday. And I said, oh, God, a fucking plant. He said, oh, you're fun to give things to, you know? But I knew it was going to die, and it did, see? Now my plants are all alive, but I'm not well yet, because I got a couple of them. One of them's gotten so big it needs a new pot, right? I mean, they're healthy. And I looked at this plant that needed a new pot one day. I broke myself up. I looked at it, and my mind is saying, Jesus Christ, what do you want now? You know. <laughs> I wired you every goddamn day to carry, and now you want more. You know, now you want a new pot. Jesus, you know. Is it not enough? <laughs> I uh, have a lot of conversations with myself in the mirror because I like me. Okay? And I now walk by a mirror a lot of times, and I will catch my impression as I walk by a mirror, and I will wink, or I will smile. Right. Yes, definitely. It is such a trip. And when I'm home alone now, someone is there. Because there's a lot of feelings going on. I may be sitting on the couch and for no explainable reason start to cry. Sadness will just overcome me. But I never allowed myself that before in sobriety. I'd be walking through the house and suddenly I'd feel sad. And the mind would say, what do you feel sad about? Jesus, I don't know. Well, you're not working much of a program if you feel sad. <laughs> you know, oh, okay, then I don't feel sad. I really feel good. You know, that's, <clears throat> that's why we have so many tense people telling people they feel okay at me. How do you feel? I feel good. You know, fine, no problem. You know, just a little... Chink in my neck. <laughs> I have learned to be gentle with myself. I have learned to be kind to me, considerate with me, and intimate with me. And somebody said something to me years ago, and I hated it when I heard it, and I'm going to repeat it, and it's true. And you may hate it too when you hear it, like I did. A relationship between two people demands <clears throat> communication, love, consideration and intimacy okay if I cannot give have communication with myself 
give consideration, love, and intimacy to myself, it is impossible for me to give it to you. Until I can have a relationship with me, I can't have one with you. No matter how hard I might try, I can't give it to you if I can't give it to me. So the old adage, and I've heard this from a lot of really qualified people, is really true. Forget what they say. Watch what they do. If you're contemplating anything new with anybody, watch what they do. How do they treat themselves? Because that's how you're going to be treated. Sometime, some point, that's exactly how you're going to be treated. So it's like, today, the fact that I will drive me to Long Beach, that I will take me out and run me, that I have eliminated Jesus from my life, what? Everything. I've eliminated beef and pork and sugar and salt and coffee and diet sodas and cigarettes and the list goes on, you know. <clears throat> Water is about the only thing I drink, and by um, you know, you can see how unhappy I am. Uh, I hope to come back here uh, in, in December and run the marathon. You know, God and I and a bear will come, <laughs> and we'll see what happens. Um, it's like. <clears throat> It's okay, I guess what I'm trying to say, what I'm trying to share with you is all the experiences I have. So you know it's okay, you don't have to sit around here and judge yourself. I mean, you can look at the job that your folks did and say, God, you know what, they really fucked up. You know, they really didn't do well. Because I spent a lot of time with people now in a program, and friends of mine and I, we start to talk about it. And the childhoods that I have shared and listened to from them are absolutely horrendous, horrendous. And the emotional damage that's done is lethal. One of my best friends, his mother walks around the apartment for three weeks saying, you and your father are the biggest problems in my life. If you people weren't in my life, I would be okay. And at the end of three weeks, she took her life using the gas stove with him in the apartment. Okay? I have a good friend whose mother walked in in the middle of the night drunk when he was six years old and poured a pail of garbage on him and said, this is what you are. Garbage. I have friends that have been beaten until they were hospitalized and have their bones bent still today. And we try and walk around like that doesn't matter. It matters a lot. Because it's off of that is exactly how you take care of yourself today. And I've got to tell you something. The same thing applies to you that applies to me. You didn't do anything to deserve it. Nothing. You're really okay. You're the best person in the world. And you're the single most important person in your life. And man, I gotta tell you, if I can start taking care of me and loving me and caring about me and having a really dynamite life, you can do the same thing for yourself. God bless you. Thanks for listening. Please support the channel by liking and subscribing.